This is the Sperry T1 bomb sight, the American version of the English Mark 14 bomb sight. Although the United States officially only used three bomb sites in World War II, the Norden, the Sperry S1, and the Estapi bomb site, the British needed far more Mark 14 bomb sites than they were able to produce, and therefore they asked the Americans to manufacture this for them, and it was done under the direction of the Sperry Corporation as the Sperry T1. Although most of these bomb sites were shipped back to England for use in their bombers, some did make it into American aircraft, particularly the B-25 and B-26, and occasionally the B-24 and possibly the B-17. The T-1 did not function at all like the Norden or Sperry S-1 bomb site. This was derivative of a long line of course setting bomb sites by the English. The computer, which is this suitcase-like apparatus in the picture, would actually calculate the drop angle based on information provided by the bombardier, and it, the drop angle information was then fed into the sight head by these rotary drive shafts, and the sight head would pivot to the correct drop angle. This meant that the drop angle was computed prior to the bomb run and since this was so efficient it only required 10 seconds to actually set up. Also the bomb run could be conducted in a turn or a climb or a dive although not a skid. Three pieces of information were provided by the bombardier prior to beginning the bomb run. These could actually be input before the bomb bomber left the ground. The first of these was the terminal velocity of the bomb. This information was used instead of time of fall information as with the Norden or the Sperry S1. The second would be the barometric pressure at the target and the height of the target above sea level. The altimeter in the T1 would calculate the height of the bomber above sea level, but it was necessary to know the height of the target above sea level so that the height above the target could be determined. Once on the bomb run, two critical pieces of information had to be provided by the bombardier. The first was the wind speed, and the second was the wind direction. The T1 side head could actually be used as a drift meter to assist in those calculations. The course information was fed into the bomb site via a remote compass indicator or a course knob and therefore that could be input either automatically or manually. The T1 computer uses both electrical and pneumatic power to operate. Here you can see the 27 volt DC input on this end. And over here at the lower aspect, you can see the 60 pound per square inch air pressure that is used to drive the bellows and make the bomb site function. Just above that, you can see the pitot and static ports the pitot to have air pressure to simulate airspeed and the static to drive both airspeed and altimeter. In addition to the pneumatic air pressure power required to run the computer and the pitot and static uh, inputs, both the computer and the side head had vacuum powered gyros as seen here. The side head gyro was to stabilize the mirror in roll and the computer gyro was designed to stabilize the entire unit in pitch. This is the course knob. This would be altered by a remote course knob or a remote compass. However, we can also alter that by manipulating the course turn knob here on this end and this changes the course heading of the bomb site. 
this is the wind direction knob and below it we have the wind speed knob and both of these play into the drift function. This is the terminal velocity knob which sets the terminal velocity of the bomb which is, is different than the time of fall input used for the Norton and Sperry bomb site. This is our airspeed indicator and this is an odometer which told the technician that the airspeed indicator was correctly calibrated and at an airspeed of 200 miles per hour this should read approximately 177. Over here we see the height above target dial which is essentially an altimeter and it had its own odometer and when this was set at 5,000 feet the odometer generally read about 35 and a half. Below you can see the all-important drop angle indicator and this would change based on all the various inputs with air speed, ground speed, headwind, and altitude above target. This knob set the uh, height above target. So if the target was elevated above the ground, that would be added into or subtracted from the height above target dial. And here's where we set the barometric pressure of the target. This little bubble would be set to level. And this is where the gyroscope would interact with the drop angle indicator so that the airplane could drop bombs in a climb or a dive. When we come around over here on this side, we see the pneumatic function and the bellows that operate the bomb site. Each of these bellows received air pressure or decreased pressure from the static port. And as these inflated and deflated, they would alter a blade which was located in between two jets. This is the airspeed on the right and the altitude on the left. And you can see that as these bellows expanded and contracted, they would shift this small blade. It's very difficult to see, but there are two air jets blowing that 60 pound per square inch air across from one to the other. And as this blade would descend and rise, it would alternately interrupt the airflow between those jets and you can see that there is a curved angle on the blade so that as the airspeed and other parts of the bomb site move to the left or the right it would change its interaction with the blade. These are the other small bellows that would be powered as this moved up and down and alternately interrupted the air supply. As the, again, as the airspeed uh, sector moved to the right, you can see that the curve of the blade changed its interaction. These small bellows located throughout would be affected by the air pressure, and they would alter the interaction of these bobbins with the motors as the motors rotated. You can see here one motor rotating and how these little bobbins would spin. And there's one on either end of this servo motor. And as the bellows inflated and deflated, they moved the bobbin to the left or the right so that a different side of the bobbin would interact with the servo motor and reverse course back and forth as it was moved with the blade interrupting the jet flow. So there was an equilibrium reached as the bellows went up and down that caused the bobbins to uh, choose one direction or the other and go back and forth. This is the other side of the gyroscope which also would interrupt an air supply and alter the uh, drop angle depending on a climb or a dive. Here we see the bomb site turned on and working. And you can hear the different parts of the bomb site reaching equilibrium and hunting. 
here is the gyroscope starting to stabilize. And the uh, drift knob is hunting back and forth. We're going to bring the airspeed up to 200 knots. by increasing the pitot pressure. And now you can see that with the airspeed at 200 knots, we're reading approximately 178 on the counter. And you can also see that our drop angle has changed considerably. We're gonna next bring the height above target knob up to about 5,000 feet. And you can see we're reading about 35 and a half there and about 178 there, which means the bomb size is calibrated correctly. And our drop angle has changed again with the increase in the height of our target. Here you see as we lift the bomb sight and change the angle, the lift angle also changes. Now we'll add in some wind from 90 degrees off to one side. And you'll see that as we add wind speed, the drift shaft will start to rotate. Here you can see the illuminated crosshairs on this piece of glass, which was called a mirror. And the bombardier would wait until the target came into view and intersected the crosshairs before manually releasing the bomb. There is a spring-loaded lever here that would allow the bombardier to put the crosshairs out on the target further out for easier identification. Here you can see gyroscopic stabilization of the mirror in roll. The mechanism was internally geared so that the mirror would only rotate at half of the bank angle. Here you can see the side head rotate left and right as the drift angle is established. Here is a closer version of the drift mechanism in action. Here you can see the side head rotate as the dropping angle is established up or down. The top portion of the side head is called the collimator and that is what actually projected the crosshairs onto the mirror. Although the T1 was not as accurate as the Norden or Sperry, it served the English quite well. It's unclear exactly how many of these were made, but at least 23,500 were made in the United States. And here again is a close-up version of the collimator rotating fore and aft with a change in the drop angle. The lighted crosshairs also proved quite useful to the British for nighttime bombing.